عندنا وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله Good to have you on the show Thank you, good to have you as well Thank you very much Sayyidina we'll kick start the show straight away inshallah so we can get some questions in and phone calls in later on The first question that we received and we want to talk about inshallah is that in the last show we discussed for example the sexual organs how can how is it important for a father or mother to discuss these issues with their son or their daughter? Why is it important? Well, we know very well that our sons and our daughters are a trial in some cases in Islamic thought from God. And we know very well that even the prophets of God, if you look at them, many of them faced major trials with their sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are many families out there who try their hardest with their sons or with their daughters. Mm -hmm to keep them on the path in what is a very difficult period. There's so many challenges that are faced out there, mm. let alone the natural sexual desires that uh, the human being has. If you look within the Holy Quran, you'll find not every prophet of God necessarily had children who turned out to be the most religious people. Indeed, some prophets of God had children who turned out to be um, disbelievers at the end of their lives. So these prophets such as Adam, such as Nuh, such as Yaqub السلام, these prophets had major trials and tribulations, one may argue, with sons such as Qabil, for example. Mm. But what you found is that when a person recognizes that they're going to have children who are going to be a test, who may be a trial from God, it's fundamental mm. that we're ready to open up even on the most controversial or challenging mm -hmm. areas that we may not have experienced when we were their age because you know especially if you're looking at some of our communities for example some of our communities for example let's say they came from Iraq mm. some of them came you know from the Middle East from Africa from that background India Pakistan the sexual challenges that may be faced in that society are definitely not necessarily going to be the same as Europe and America, for example. In those societies, you may have more of a focus sometimes on, um, for example, um, a more traditional outlook, very conservative. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're looking, for example, at the Middle East, at America, or you're looking at Europe, there may be more of a liberal outlook course, on yeah. certain things. I don't want to generalize and say, that everybody has a liberal outlook, but you could say generally there was a more liberal outlook. So now when you come to this country in the 1980s, for example, or you come in the 1990s, the parents find a dilemma. Are we to be extra conservative with our children mm. where they can only go to school, go to the mosque, go to school, go to the mosque? Or what happens when, for example, our children want to go out with their friends? And they want to go out with their friends, for example, to town. They want to go to their friends, play sports. Mm. They want to go with their friends to the shopping centers. In some of our parents' generation, you'll find that this was unheard of in a more conservative city. There's a huge culture clash, essentially. Yeah, there is a culture clash. Yeah. And that culture clash is one where, for example, you're told any mixing with the opposite gender is completely forbidden. Um, you'll find that many parents would have met their, you know, you met your wife mm -hmm. because of an arranged relationship. And now you find yourself in a society where it's extremely normal to have the opposite gender, even just as a friend, not someone who you, you may want to have a, a sexual uh, mm -hmm. relationship with. So it becomes, I think, more important that the parents firstly recognize that their children's times may be different to their times. Of course. And that secondly, the parents are, there is a willingness from the parents to adapt, where the parents are willing to say that, you know what, let me sit with my child, let me discuss which issues they're facing. If you look in the Quran, there's a story named after a man who himself was not necessarily a prophet of God, but was a man of wisdom. Mm. And that man was Luqman. Luqman al Hakim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, gives him a whole story in the Quran. And one may argue, Prophets like Musa and Isa didn't get stories named after them. Yet Luqman gets a story named after him. And in this story, you find that Luqman السلام, has a very intriguing discussion with his son where he realizes that there are challenges that his son is facing which the father never expected him to necessarily face. Mm -hmm. 
As then from the beginning, there, there's the challenge of belief in the oneness of God. Ya Bunay, la tushrik billah. Inna shirka la dhulmun azim. Oh my son, do not put partners to Allah. For polytheism is one of the greatest forms of oppression mm -hmm. to the soul of the human being. And then Luqman goes on to talk about, for example, Aqim as salat, a'mur bil ma'roof, anha an al munkar. Wasbur ala ma ashabak, for example. Make sure that you establish salah, make sure that you enjoin the good, make sure that you're of those who, for example, forbids the evil, be patient with what you face. He then later on begins to talk with him about, for example, uh, the way he walks, the way he talks. That father in the Quran recognized, I cannot expect my son, just because he's the son of a religious family, not to face certain trials and certain tests in their day-to-day -day life. One can argue that that son would face more trials than any normal person. Yeah. As they're, you, they're under the pressure. I, I think mm. that many times you'll find that there are Sayyids, Sheikhs, Maulanas, whose sons and daughters in many cases have so much pressure on them, unfairly. At the end of the day, you didn't choose to be born to be in that family, into yeah. the family of a, of a Mawlana, of mm. a renowned scholar, or of a Mufti, or of a Qadi, or something. Unfairly, that our community reckon, thinks straight away that if they're the son of Sayyid Fulan, the son of Sheikh Fulan, they, they have to be religious. Mm. Not at all. As Allah told Nabi Nuh alayhi salam, that look, that son of yours, for example, um, he's not one of your family. Even Nabi Nuh faces this test with his son. And so I think we put that pressure there. But whether you're from the family of a sheikh or a sayyid, the humans are human. When bulur comes, when adolescence comes, there's a frantic hormonal change taking place. Now either that father sits the son down in that 7 to 14 age period, as the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family mentioned, that that 7 to 14 age period, that's a period of, for example, discipline, mm -hmm. let's say. Either you sit your son down, when you sit your son down, you open up or you find avenues to become friends with your son where you can open up on such issues. Because the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, he says that from the age of 14 to 21, that should be a period of friendship. Mm. Sadly, for many sons, that's the period when their dads don't yeah. talk to them much at all. You'd expect your dad to come and sit with you. Uh, are you interested, for example, you, let's say you're 20 years old. Have you thought about marriage? Would you like me to pursue helping you get married? Or for example, at the moment, are you going out with anyone? If you are going out with anyone, are you doing it in the legitimate way or an illegitimate way? For example, are you finding that, do you know the laws of, for example, purification? If you've had sexual intercourse, there are some people who don't have a clue until old age about, for example, ghusl, you know, after sexual intercourse. They'll have sex and after having had sex, they don't know that, for example, Islam talks of a major ablution and Islam talks of a minor ablution. So with the fathers, I believe, and likewise with the mothers, with the mothers, you'll find that I think the mothers do try and build more of a friendship with their daughters. But still, I believe that sometimes for that mother or father, they'll always believe that their young girl is still young, no even matter, if she's no 22. How old she gets, yeah. And they'll always believe sometimes that their young girl is as innocent as she's ever been. What they don't know is maybe that that young girl of theirs can take you to the river and bring you back thirsty. Mm -hmm. Meaning that that girl knows everything that's going on. You think that you're going to speak to your daughter, like you know some of our grandmothers, may God bless them. I always wonder about the conversation they had with our mothers about what exactly was going to happen in marriage. Now, I don't know how our grandmothers described sexual acts. I'm sure they had their own ways, but I think today the old grandmother metaphors need to go and mothers have to be a bit more blatant with their daughters mm -hmm. in telling them that, listen, it's more of an open society. So, Snapchat, yeah. Instagram, Facebook, Facebook, Very Twitter, different. You can easily befriend anybody out there and you can have a sexual liaison with anybody. But Sayyidina, uh, don't you think there might be a danger when discussing these certain topics like for example mut'a or doing, having a relationship in a legitimate way, don't you think there's a danger of that son or daughter making that more important than marriage or long-term marriage? There is no doubt that long-term marriage remains the most important. Mm. 
act and the most important goal. We're trying on this show to face the realities. 100%. There is a reality out there that as much as we'd want many of our youths to be patient, and I think that we have a number of our youths who can be patient, there are also a number of our youths who find it very difficult in a hypersexualized society. And when I say hypersexualized society, someone might think we're only talking Europe and America. The internet has changed the ball game completely. 100%. You could be anywhere in the world. Indeed, I would argue that some Arab countries probably have more porn being passed around and some Middle Eastern countries have more porn being passed around than even here. Yes, it might not be done in the open. You might not have, for example, pornography stores. You might not have sex shops in the open. But people still have the ability to pass on messages from one friend to another, from 100%. one group to another, mm -hmm. from one circle to another. When we live in this hypersexualized society, we have to make clear what Islam says. My Prophet, peace be upon him, his family does not tell his companions in early Islam the method for finding satisfaction to their sexual desires when they used to go away from their wives. When he's saying such things, he must be offering a certain solution. Of course. But at the end of the day, in many other lectures and many other of our programs, we've always stressed that the norm and the greatest act is, of course, the permanent marriage. The temporary marriage can never take the place of the permanent marriage. And anyone who thinks the temporary marriage has got as much reward as the permanent marriage, no, not at all. When we're looking at the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, they found pride and honor in having a partner for life. The year of grief was a year for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, when he lost his wife Khadija. He never showed that much sadness for any wife like he showed for Sayyidah Khadija. So if we're following the example of our Prophet, peace be upon his family, then definitely the permanent marriage is the norm. Mm. Now, say you mentioned how permanent marriage <coughs> is more important. But like you said, there is a reality in society. And the reality is no matter how much we do push permanent marriage out, there are still videos going around on social media. There are people interacting through social media behind their parents' backs, maybe in universities, in colleges. How do we tackle this issue and ensure they do it the legit way rather than falling into zina? I, I'd be happy if you find your future spouse in university. Mm. But naturally, it's going to be a test whether you can maintain a dignified relationship in that period. And I'd be happy if there is a change in the Muslim community, and I'm talking the Ja'fari madhab, other madhab who may reject, for example, the temporary marriage, I'd be happy if parents now, if somebody came to propose for their daughter, but they're still at uni, meaning that they may not necessarily be able to afford to live alone at the moment, to pay rents and bills and so on. I'd be happy if there are fathers out there who would say, well, if you've come to propose for my daughter, then you can be in a temporary relationship with each other, meaning engagement. Mm. As I mentioned in the last show, why do we always in the engagement do aqid of nikah or of ketbik term? Why can't it be a mut'a engagement? And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, the father can set conditions. You two can see each other. You two can hang with each other. But there will be no sexual relationship, for example, until you get married in terms of a permanent marriage. That's number one. Number two, in that period, say it doesn't work out. Then an engagement broke. If you had done Ketbik Tab or Nikah, if it doesn't work out, divorced. Of course. Even if you had been together for a month, even if you had been together for two months, six months, you're divorced. Yeah, but I've never lived with this person. Mm. You know, I, I, we, we, we got, got, we got engaged yeah. and our wedding is going to come. No. Because you've done an aqid of nikah, for example, being the uh, da'imi rather than the munqata, mm -hmm. being the permanent rather than the temporary, then you're divorced. That person will find it difficult then. Of course. The girl and the guy, both of them will find it difficult to be in a society which stigmatizes the divorcee. So, if you're telling me now you're at your, let's say, society at university or someone's on the same course as you, where better to find your future partner than in the university setting. Mm. You can be in that university setting, get to know each other, but take it to your parents. I think that is 
something if you're certain that you're going to get married to each other. Mm. Now, in that period before marriage, you can get to know with, uh, one another. There's no harm there. You could talk with each other, go out with each other. Islam is not a religion that wanted to force us into not being able to build our futures. Islam wanted to find a way of bringing ease rather than hardship. Now, follow, following up on that, uh, you mentioned, you know, if you meet someone in university, for example, and you're serious about it, you should take it to their parents. Let's assume, and this is a question that has come through, let's assume that um, their parents are happy with these two um, youth to get to know each other, but haven't done a proposal or aqid. But both parents are happy with them to get talking. Is it permissible uh, for them to get physical in any way, maybe cross certain boundaries, let's say that someone might class as boundaries? What's the limit? If there is no legal contract mm. between you and the person you're with, meaning that there is no dowry agreed, for example, that there is no time period that's mm. agreed, then there is no relationship there. And what I mean by that is, say for example, you went to propose for someone, the parents accepted. And they've said that your aqid, for example, is when? Is in two months. The parents have said yes. In that two months, you still will have to wait for the parents' permission before you can hug your wife, your future wife, or kiss your future wife. And so. But you, you might turn around to me and say, but her parents already know. Her parents have said to us that in two months' time, there'll be an engagement. You've gone to each other's house, you've drunk whatever you've drunk, and you, you know, people have these different celebrations for doing these things. You, you, you've done all of this, but the dad, for example, turns around and says, my, my daughter's not doing no more. You're like, no, no, Habib, that's just a contract just to allow us. To... No, no. In my tribe, that's not allowed. In my culture, that's not allowed. You know, sometimes you have, you know, wallah, having an open-minded father is a blessing from Allah course, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believe you me. Because, you know, I myself am honored that I come from a family open-minded. Whereas sometimes you'll find there are families out there. The tribal leader who lives here has decided, Habibi, who's, I don't really care about your mm. tribal leader. And I will never care about him. But say, no, so off, would you blame a girl who does mut'ah because she's waiting to get married, but her parents are so picky about, for example, this person's from that family, from that city, from that tribe. He's not earning enough. Would you blame her if she goes into mut'a or agrees mut'a with someone? Well, obviously you have, as I've mentioned before, you have maraja who allow, for example, for a person to be involved in a relationship um, as long as, for example, intercourse does not happen. Um, and you also have maraja who puts a particular stipulation sometimes. And that stipulation is that is she independent? And is she reached the level of maturity? And I think that we're going to come to a period where the definitions of independence and maturity are really relative definitions. Mm -hmm. What's independence? There used to be a time where a girl could not have any money unless her dad gave her some money to leave the house. Now you have girls who've earned more than their dads will ever dream. Mm -hmm. Now what's independence? Is that girl really relying on her father? Because we know the idea of the father figure is more of an idea of guidance rather than Authority. an actual established principle. Mm. Because there are maraja who turn around when it comes to the principles of you know, the father having to give his permission. And they'll say no. And so I think that there are certain legal terms. Whether it's the legal terms of you know, rushd mm. or bulur and other terms where a person has to look at them and say... Is this definitions of adolescence and definitions of, for example, independence and maturity, do they need a rethink? Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, in certain societies, a girl will only be under her dad's roof. And even when the guy has got engaged to her, everything's normal, the dad will still say, you can't go out with each other. You do know that. That's, yeah, yeah, there's parts that of the, happens. There's parts happens of the Middle there. East. Happens here a lot. There, there's parts of the Middle mm -hmm. East where they're blatant about it, where they'll say to you, for example, that you know what you're gonna you're, you two are engaged but you wait till the wedding 
until I see you together. Yeah, but dad, we're, we're engaged. We're married. That's yeah, engaged. surely <laughs> now is the time for us to be hanging out. You're not hanging out. And if you are hanging out, you can hang out in front of me. Go you're on. sitting on that sofa and you're sitting on that sofa. And, and mm. so is that Islam or is that mm. culture? Now, we have to rethink some of our legal discussions mm. now with this Western demographic and with the possible differences in Orf. Person may have to rethink some of these areas, which some Maraja already have. Mm. Yeah. Now, Sayyidina, if the dad is so picky, and you say, for example, the girl does go into Mut'a, even though he doesn't agree, let's assume that she's independent, fitting that criteria. Would you suggest to someone to marry a girl who has been in Mut'a, has been involved in Mut'a? What's she done? A criminal act? Mm. What's she done? Well, if it's open knowledge, like the whole community knows. Who cares what the community knows, in all honesty? Mm. You rely on the community? Mm. <sighs> you know, people love to throw stones in their houses. Not just made out of glass, glass which is just so uh, easy to break. Mm. You know, a lot of people do care about what everyone thinks. I'll, you know, for me personally, someone who's tried to make sure that instead of the easiness of zina, Mm. How easy adultery is, how easy fornication is. Someone has turned around and said, No, I want to follow my Lord's commands. Why would I see that as a negative? And who's going to tell me it's a negative? Mm. My community? You know, everyone's got their own legal challenges. That same person who tells you that this girl has done this and this could be someone who's known to scam from the government, steal money from mm. the government. Lying, people backbiting. blame others to cover their own tracks. There, are many have got many glass mm. houses out there with their own issues where their kids sometimes, subhanallah, the ones who attack people the most. If you look at their kids, Qabi looked better. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at some people, he walks around like you know, he's the judge of how everybody is. So, your children, I don't know if they're you know, I don't know what their use is in society. So for someone now to come and attack a sister in the community, firstly, such statements are either ghibah or buhtan, backbiting or slandering. Backbiting, yeah, you may be telling the truth about somebody, but you know that they don't like you to talk about that. Slandering, you may even have lied about someone. Mm -hmm. A few years later, and this is, this is the arrogance of the human being, you lied about someone's reputation. A few years later, you found out you were wrong. You don't have the humility to go and tell them. Or even apologize. No. Mm. Hey, you know, I heard this. You spread it, you spread it, you spread it. A few years later, you're like, I got that completely wrong. Nothing even happened there. And what's happened to that poor girl? Someone in our communities destroyed her reputation. So if you're asking me, someone, I look at the cup half, half full, not half empty, mm -hmm. that someone's tried to maintain the boundaries of God, that's someone to be respected. Now, you did earlier mention zina. It is one of the biggest sins. Can a sin like zina be forgiven? Yeah, every sin that you commit in this world, you can be forgiven for before you die. Mm. Every single sin. And even if someone says to me, well, in an Islamic state, can there be the door of forgiveness for murder, for example? Mm. So you murdered someone. We know very well that even in the laws of murder, sometimes it may be a case of blood money being paid. Sometimes it may be a case that forgiveness is better. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran repeatedly mentions that he is ghafoor and rahim. That he is the all forgiving, the all merciful. That wonderful verse of the Holy Quran that I think every single Muslim household should memorize when they're asked what's the most beautiful of verses of the Holy Quran. Oh my servants who have been extravagant against themselves. Never dis be despondent of the mercy of Allah. For Allah forgives every sin. Now when I say Allah forgives every sin, we have to make a disclaimer here. Can't be an excuse that, okay, if Allah forgives every sin, I'm going to sin for the next 10 years, then I'll go to Hajj, mm. and I'll get married, and then I'll become religious. No, it doesn't work like that. 
A person who recognizes, for example, that, you know what, I've committed this sin. Imam Ali ibn al Talib alayhi salam once heard a person say, Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu alayhi. Imam said to him, do you know what that means? If someone committed zina, for example, they had sex outside of marriage. They had sex with someone who's married. And they say, Astaghfirullah mm. Rabbi wa atubu alayhi. He said to him, the first sign that you've been forgiven by Allah, the first meaning of Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu alayhi, is that you regret what you've done. Mm. Can't just be a case that, you know what, I did this, but I was young, so these things happen. No, no, it has to be a case of, you know what, don't look at the size of the sin. Sincere regret. Look at who you were disobeying, Imam mm. Zain al-Abidin says. Secondly, is that you never ever do that act again. You know, you can't have committed zina. And then, a couple of weeks later, having done astaghfirullah, Rabbi wa you're back doing zina again. You're back doing adultery again. So the first is to regret. The second is never <coughs> to do it again. Do it again yeah. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam in a wonderful tradition mentions that half of repentance is what? Is regret. Is that a person actually regrets what they have done. And so we in the Muslim community, if there are youths whose sexual desires led them mm. to break the rights of what Imam Zain al-Abidin said are the hukuk of the private parts, that you don't use them for, you know, for zina, mm. those youths in our community or even those elders, there may be people who are married, who are watching the show, who for example did this when they were younger. Allah's door of repentance never closes and the main condition is that a person makes sure that they never do this again. Yeah. We're going to go to a question that we've got uh, online. This is from Sister Fatima from America. She says, is it obligatory to have sex on the wedding night? Is there too much pressure in our cultures to do this? No, I, think, I think there is. Uh, there's pressure in our cultures to the extent that I heard that there are certain cultures which want to see the bed sheet. Mm which is absolutely absurd, absolutely ridiculous. But what happens, you know, the human being is an unbelievable creature, can be higher than an angel, lower than mm. an animal. They actually, in some places, would say to you that show us the bed sheet to prove, to the... prove that the girl is a virgin. Now, that's not only ridiculous, but firstly, who brought about such a culture? It's not Islamic. <clears throat> There's no stress that on the first night of your, of your marriage, a person has to have sex. Um, for all you know, the couple may have had sex a few times before they've come to the first night. Mm -hmm. But mommy and daddy still think that, you know what, they're, you know, they're very innocent. And, um, and I think what you find is, is that there is this pressure. And it's very sad. I feel sorry for those ladies who were told, you know what, let's see the bed sheet, if there's blood on there, then yes, she's a virgin and she's, and so on. And, and so this pressure is there, even sometimes the friend circle might turn around and might say that, you know what, make sure that you uh, have, uh, you know, intercourse tonight and I'll see you in the morning and so on. And even language like that is not necessarily the language which we accustom with the followers of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi mm -hmm. Um, and even when it comes to that wedding night, for example, if your relationship is one which is a truly loving relationship um, and you've been very close to each other before, it may come to that wedding night where, for example, the girl may turn around to you and say, well, I'm tired, you know, because the amount of pressure that goes mm -hmm. into that whole wedding day is unbelievable. Um, the girl might turn around to you and say, you know what, I'm tired. The girl might turn around to you and say, can we, can we leave it for tonight? She might turn around. She might be say, nervous. Might be nervous as well, yeah. which is a big thing. That there might be a situation where, for example, it's the first time um, that she has come near such an act. Um, and even for, for, for the guy who, who said that all the guys who are getting married necessarily have had relationships before. Um, and it's not just about sex, the whole relationship. It's fundamental. Mm but also it's about empathizing with the feelings of the person who's with you. 
Now, there's all sorts of stories which I, in my own uh, lecture and career, have come across many stories about what happens on that night. And there are some guys who've had the odd slap because they've got near. There are other guys who've been told blatantly that, you know what, some minds are elsewhere. There's guys who've told their wives that I'm not interested in you. There's guys who've told their wives that they may be interested in someone else who they've had a relationship with. So while the parents may be there wondering mm. what's this, show me a sheet, show me blood, show me all of this, what they don't realize is that could be the least of their challenges mm. that night. But Islamically, there is no such thing that on your wedding night, you know, Islam wedding night, there is mentioning of supplications to be of recited. Course. There's mentioning of prayers to be prayed. But there certainly is nothing about it's obligatory that a person has to have sex on their wedding night. Then Sayyidina, let's assume that uh, you've been told as, a, as the guy, you've been told that by the girl that mm. she's still a virgin. Yes. So you've gone into this marriage with the understanding that she's a virgin. And then on the wedding night, you find out that you've been lied to and she's in fact not a virgin. What do you do in this situation? As in, does that break the legal, oblig like the legal contract that you have with them? I wouldn't say it necessarily breaks the legal contract. And I would also say that there could be a possibility that a mistake was done in someone's teenage years, which they felt that they may lose their partner, their partner never found out. Um, although now, with the you know operations available, even if someone does lose their virginity, there's ways in which you can you know ensure that nobody will find out. So, you know, even if people assume that just because they are with somebody that night and automatically it means that oh I'm going to see lots of blood or oh that means that this person is definitely not a virgin, those are things to take on board. But I think it's important that if somebody faces this issue, not straight away to lash out, not straight away to lose their temper, mm -hmm. but to actually ask them, you know, what, what, talk to me. Why didn't you tell me this before? There could be other reasons, and I'm sad to say such things. I really am, but there could be other reasons which nobody wishes on a girl as to how she lost, for example, her virginity and her innocence. Mm. Um, but I don't think a person should lash out straight away, although I always believe if there is a situation where somebody may have had a moment in their life before they've got married, which has stuck with them, I think it's good to tell the person who you're with in your engagement period. You see, I just want to focus on this a bit. The engagement period, if you two feel things aren't going well, don't fall victim to the pressure of those around you mm -hmm. saying to you that you have to remain in this marriage otherwise our family will be embarrassed you're not clicking don't continue there's no sexual attraction don't continue mm -hmm. you feel the person you're with you've seen something listen could be anything mm -hmm. could be you've seen for example I don't know, a person may smell something in the person with them and they just don't like their odor mm -hmm. a person may see that someone for example their body is not what they expected. And I think with Photoshop these days, um, a, you know, mag magic can be done. Yeah, sure. I can look good and, you know, and, and you so do on. Look good. <laughs> so, so even, even with these things, Habibi, I think it's very important that in that engagement period, don't listen to the pressures of those around you. There's a danger of actually going ahead of the marriage, maybe having children and then falling out. Correct. I'm not mm. saying that you break an engagement all mm. of a sudden when there's a difficulty. No. There's ways to patch things up. Mm. But I also think if both of you have had a certain situation that could come back later mm. on, talk to your partner. Mm. Do you suggest that solution in every situation? Like, for example, we're talking about now the trust of the woman. What about the trust of the man? Say, say the wife catches the man cheating. What do you do in that situation? Because that's... Uh, pack, uh, pack your <laughs> bags. Pack your bags. <laughs> At that moment, you pack your bags and you, and you, and you run. Uh, no, I think, um, I think, you know, you're asking me what do you do if, if you catch your husband cheating? What are we talking about? You catch your fiance cheating, you catch your husband who you've been married to for 15 years cheating. You know, what's going on? I don't think it's as easy, you know, 
the really each, each scenario is different, let's say. Each scenario, because if you're, if you're with a fiancé and your fiancé is, for example, uh, someone who's, who's already cheating on you, that should give you an indication yeah. that, you know, this person who you're with is not exactly going to be uh, someone who you can necessarily trust. Mm. Um, Husband-wise, you know, those are complicated issues. And I'm not going to back up any... Any guy out there who's having, you know, I don't, you know, I know that sometimes these things hurt. Of course. Sometimes they break families with kids and so on. I'm not going to back anyone up on this. But that, at that moment, a person has to ask, where's the relationship gone? Mm. What's happening? There has to be a reflection on this. Mm. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Sayyidina, uh, for answering these questions that we had from the viewers. We'll answer more after the break, inshallah. So, dear viewers, stay tuned in, and inshallah, we will, we will return to answer more of your questions. And uh, we'll see you in a bit, inshallah. Welcome back, <coughs> dear viewers, to live in London with <coughs> Dr. Said Ammar Naqshawani. I would like to remind you, dear viewers, you can call in at any time and direct your questions to the Sayyid. The number is 0203515 With the UK code, it would be plus 442035150199. Now, Sayyidna, before the break, we were talking about if the lady, the wife, catches her husband cheating, which is a big issue and it's happened a mm. lot. What is the correct thing to do in that situation? Well, let me ask you, what would you tell your sister? She's married to somebody and, and she comes and tells you that's that, a, uh, or maybe I'm asking the wrong person <laughs> because uh, we could all get arrested <laughs> on the show right now. Um, but on, on, a, on a serious note, if your sister told you that, mm. you know, I just found out that my fiance, let's say. Mm. Let's start there. My fiance, I've caught him. How did you catch him? For example, these days, people may even make fake accounts. Mm. Or, for example, I caught him WhatsApping somebody mm. and then I checked the number. What would you tell your sister to do in such a situation? Honestly? Yes. And he's a very close friend of yours, let's say. That changes it. Okay. No, I no, think, no. I think, Hold on one second. Okay, the fact that he's You can't be defending your friend because no, he's no, a close no, friend no. of yours. On the contrary, if it was a close friend, I'd be even more annoyed. Okay, so you'll tell her there and then pack your bags? I'll tell her depending on what's been done. If it's just simple as messages and maybe it's a small mistake. Messages maybe, saying, maybe, I love you, no, no, I okay, miss see, you, last night that's was different. amazing. No, no, if it's, for example, messages that have been misinterpreted, I'll assess the situation. But if it's something like your messaging, that's a straight pack your bags, come home before anything escalates. And then what would you say to her when she tells you, that's it, I made my mind up? That's it. Yeah. That's it. Bring her home. Because that's not, if that's happening at the beginning of the marriage, yes. then imagine what will happen further down the line. Now, that six years they've been married, four kids. I think mathematically that works. And, <laughs> and, and let's say, for example, See, you don't want to put me in the situation. Yes, let me put you in the situation. Everyone puts me in the situations the whole year. Let me put you in the situation. If, for example, now six years they've been married. See, I'd love to answer that, but we do have a call on the line. Saved by the phone ah, call. Come on. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum wa rahmatullah. Can I have your name and where you are calling from? Wa alaikum salam. How are you, brother? You okay? Alhamdulillah. Uh, my name is Hassan from uh, London. <laughs> um, it's a question, more or less. That I'm pretty sure it's related to the subject. Mm. Uh, it's more Sure. Uh, me and my wife have been married now for three years and we basically have one, one, one child which was basically a honeymoon baby. Um, now my wife has gone through a situation where she doesn't really want to have any more kids at the moment. Um, and she keeps, it's like a on and on situation, you know, where the same question you ask and it's more or less not now, not now, not now. And we come from a culture from our parents, you know, to have as many children as possible basically. Um, and they keep going, you know, you, you get the duas, you know, give you many children, many children, many children, and she gets under pressure as well. 
So is that how do we go about it? You know, how, what can what can uh, say and advise us as a family? You know, to where do we go from here? Because it comes to a point, obviously, where she becomes very adamant, and I don't want to obviously put the situation out where we don't have any more kids. Uh, but what do we do from there? Because obviously, I don't want to keep using you know precautions all all this time. Um, so yeah, it's more or less a question that to say it, if, if possible, if you could answer it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Brother Hassan. Inshallah. See, yeah, I think uh, Brother Hassan poses a great question, which many people ask, and that is, uh, and that is important that we we look at this first and foremost. Brother Hassan, you never married your parents; you married your wife. Your parents can keep encouraging as much as they want. Ultimately, this is your marriage, your relationship. Maybe your wife, for example, with the with the different challenges that you face, whether. It is in the world of work or in the world of economics. There are different trials some people have with their studies, with their employment. Maybe she thinks at this particular stage of her life, she wants to fulfill some of her ambitions, for mm. example. She wants to uh, continue working on the degree that she earns at her university. Um, and I think it's all about communication. It's not about, well, there's pressure from the cousin, so we have to have a child. Mm. That to me is a very sad reason for having um, a child. I think your relationship, you recognize that, you know what, we've had our child as a gift from God. And mind you, you can plan as much as you want. If Allah mm. subhanahu wa ta'ala decides, there are many who will say that that one was expected, that one was planned, and that one was a complete mm. accident. But I don't think a person should have the pressure of parents or of cousins as to when they have their kids. Because there are some people as well, when they, when they for example... Um, get married the girl poor girl is asked like literally a couple months after the marriage any kids mm -hmm. uh, you know some ladies will actually, actually have a look let me see the curve is she mm -hmm. pregnant hold on let me have a look let me have a look at the walk for goodness sake leave the girl alone mm -hmm. why does the girl have to become pregnant straight away the girl may decide for example that listen let's go away let's go on a holiday let's go travel the world you know in the first six months first year first year and a half cement a bond in our relationship and even cement a bond in our sex life. You know, there are some girls in some cultures when they get married straight away, they've got to live with the in-laws. Now, I've got to admit for myself personally, and that just might be the Iraqi in me, but for me personally, how do you enjoy sex when you know that two bedrooms away are your in-laws? You either have one very controlled silent sex life you know where it's just like okay done bye or you're really or, brave or you're you're brave <laughs> or even then when you want your wife to be walking around the house um you know not wearing much she's always got to be thinking about your uh, you know 60 odd year old dad who's sitting there with his tasbih sometimes <laughs> on the prayer mat and she wants to walk around wearing that so Already, that traveling period could be something that cements the relationship. But in your situation, this is all about communication with your wife. Um, there, could be, there could be moments where going away on a holiday triggers maybe a, a yearning to build the relationship mm. even further. And that could be in having a child. But please don't rely or listen to what others are encouraging. And even if you really want a child, there's the communication is fundamental mm. to say that, you know what, let's... You know, this is something I really want. And there are ways in which I'm sure you'll be able to persuade your wife. I agree fully that the communication... No, 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 we're going, coming back to your issue. <laughs> Let's come back. So now <laughs> that your, your See, wife... This is sorry, like, now I, that, I, I may get arrested. This is like... No this problem. Is <laughs> Six years, they've been married, they've got their kids, and you find out that he's been in another relationship. What do you say to her? <sighs> Would you even ask her if maybe she distance herself in a certain way from him whether there was a negligence on her part like, listen guys are guys and many of them mm. sadly can be animals more than human beings mm. we cannot come and defend you know the guys here but i think sometimes what can also take place is when a person sits with their sister for example there can be this movement to towards a routine where a person may neglect themselves that's not an excuse mm for a person to go and play around because he's saying, you know, she doesn't look after herself like she did mm. before because many guys also let go. But I think 
sometimes a person opens up with each other from the wedding day mm. or from the engagement. What do you like sexually, for example? Mm. That's something important. You know, and some guys have to realize that this girl who they're with, you know, guys, they, 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 want, uh, they want to have a very holy religious girl at home. But when it comes to their sex life, they want to have a better sex life with their partners on the side. Mm. This happens. That you'll have some guys who'll blatantly say that, you know, with a girl on the side, I will do things I'll never do to my wife. Why wouldn't you do it to your wife? Mm. Why? What is your wife? You've just bought a commodity from someone's house. There needs to be an openness in the relationship. And even in the period of engagement, maybe the girl says, listen, I don't like to see a guy with hair on his body. Maybe the girl says, I like to see a guy with hair on his body. I think the other way around, I think most guys prefer that there's absolutely no hair on the body. And, and so, for example, when it comes to even sexual acts, mm. a person may be put off if, for example, the girl that he's with does not, um, does not provide him with certain pleasures, let's say. For example, the mm. person wants to be pleasured orally. And the girl that he is with doesn't provide that. Mm. Someone might turn around and get frustrated and say, you know what, this is boring. I don't want to be in this relationship. Or I'll be in this relationship because... I'll have a bad rep if I divorce, but I'm going to enjoy such things. No, there's a communication. Mm. There's a communication. Likewise, there's a communication from the other side. Listen to what your wife wants. There are some guys, no, there's no listening at all. There are some guys who, for example, when it comes to their sex life with their partner, there's no interest in, for example, any form of foreplay, mm. no interest in anything at all. Really, okay, I'm satisfied, that's it. The girl thinks, the guy thinks psychologically different ways. Mm. Some are thinking about the emotional aspect of it all. I know guys after sex don't want to sit there and talk about emotions for the next half an hour, but that can make a world of difference to the future of your marriage. Mm. So I think when we see such situations, there, is, there are people who straight away say, this guy is the worst, divorce should happen straight away. But I think sometimes... If you sit the two together, let's open up and see where did this go wrong? The fiance situation? No, you could tell from a mile away that probably no interest mm. there. But if it happens somewhere in the marriage, I think sitting down, communicating and asking sincerely, listen, if you don't want my sister, for example, if you're sitting with your brother-in-law, you don't want my sister, go. Don't stay in this because you have to stay in this. Mm. If you don't want her, go. Because you don't want to see your sister in a relationship where the person doesn't want her at all. What if there are kids involved? And I think definitely when there are kids involved, naturally there's, there's a bit more responsibility mm -hmm. and care to be taken with that decision. Look, if there's no kids involved, it's not an excuse to just get divorced, but I think it becomes easier. But then when there are kids involved, there are you know, certain ramifications that a person mm -hmm. has to consider fiqh-wise. You know, legally there are things to consider. And no one wants to see their children brought up in a single parent home. Mm -hmm. You know, if the children, you know, they'll pick off the pressure. And when they see that, for example, within <coughs> their houses, that, you know, mom's here, but where's dad? Other kids have dad. That could cause psychological torment later 100%. on as well. Mm. Yeah. This is sort of a follow-up question. Let's assume that the relationship is not working out. The marriage is not working out. Let's assume that the wife doesn't want to have any children. Is that a good enough reason? Or is that the reason at all for the man to marry a second wife? Because, mm. as we all know, the man can marry four women. Does that apply in our society, in our time? Well, I wonder why, you know, if your wife doesn't want any children, did you just find that out? Mm -hmm. Or did you know before? If you knew before, then you can't use it as an excuse now. Mm. You know, you knew that she didn't want kids, so why did you marry her? And now, when she doesn't want kids, also that's not an excuse to go and have somebody else. If you two cannot agree on building this relationship, then maybe the relationship is not meant to be. Mm. You know, so those people who are using these excuses to get married to someone else, yes, there are certain societies where if the wife cannot have kids and the person doesn't want to divorce her, then you marry someone else. Nabi Ibrahim السلام, was married to Sarah. Sarah, his wife, could not have kids. So who did he marry? The mother of Nabi mm. Ismail, by the name of 
Haja. Mm-hmm. So when he marries Haja, she gives him Ismail. But he doesn't divorce Sarah. So maybe in that situation, he realized that he couldn't have a kid with her, but he didn't want to divorce his wife. And he ended up marrying a second wife. Now, mm-hmm. many non-Muslims, I think amongst the first questions they always ask you is, when they find out that you're a Muslim, can you marry four wives? I think many don't realize the amount of justice that has to be displayed in marrying a second wife. You got to have, you got to share the same times with both of them. You're with her three and a half days, mm. you'll be with her three and a half days. If you can psychologically handle that, that's amazing. And um, also monetarily, you have to, if you're spending $5,000 on her, you got to spend $5,000 on her. Mm. Yeah, love wise, you cannot say I love my first wife 61%. And I love my second wife 39%. You know, the Quran says you won't be able to do justice to them. Mm. Meaning that love, in terms of love, you can't do justice. But in terms of monetary and time, you can, you know, be just. But in this day and age, that's not solution for our relationships. On that note, I have two follow-up questions. The first one is if the, the couple are having relationship problems, should they go to a Mawlana? Is he the best person to go to for advice? No, or should no, they go no. to a counselor and something? No, no, no. I don't know why. Well, if you're talking general relationship problems, possibly Maulana has his wisdom. <clears throat> if you're talking sex, I, I don't know why if you're having sex issues, you'd go to Maulana. You know, who said Maulana is necessarily you know, the, the, the sex king when it comes to advice? Um, for all you know, in some cases, that Maulana hasn't seen past his stomach for many years. And... And therefore, it's not exactly going to be Mr. Stamina in the bedroom. And I think that's something important to realize mm. as well that, um, that you know, we go to Maulanas for all of our issues, when in some cases the Maulana has never been brought up where we are raised or where we're living. In some cases, you know, the Maulana's wife might be the first to complain about her sex <laughs> life, and you're going to the same guy um, who probably, you know, in some cases hasn't been on a treadmill for a few years. Um, and how he's going to have a great sex life. But then again, as we've always said, sometimes you can have someone who can have, um, can be great, can have great sex in the bedroom, but not compassionate, not soft in the sense that there is no caressing, no foreplay, Mm -hmm. no emotional attachment. So we shouldn't just think of sex as, oh, if someone's buff and built and has a six pack and has great stamina, that means that they're going to have amazing sex. If there isn't that softness there as well, because, you know, some girls are with guys, you know, I've seen some combinations in my life, which I'm, I'm in disbelief, you know, you know, that guy struck it lucky because, you know, you look at him and you're wondering, you know, but then the mind of the girl is, well, you know, he's, he's soft hearted. And, and so when a person says, let's go to Maulana, I don't know if Maulana is necessarily the best person to go to for sex advice. Mm. I think there are professionals out there who can advise us, um, who can sit with the couple and who can also provide guidance, you know, on how their sex life can be different. Mm. You know, in some cases, it could just be chatting to a best friend for advice. Honestly, there are, you know, sometimes there are girls out there who their best friends have been married for a while. Maybe they could be the best advisors, not the Mawlana. Mm. You sit with your friend, you tell them, listen, I need to come and see you. I've got an issue. And maybe you go to that friend. And when you go to that friend, it could be a case that that friend of yours is the one who can tell you mm. that, you know what? Maybe it's this issue, maybe it's that. Maybe work on this, maybe think about that. So, you know, there are different avenues. It doesn't just have to be the Mawlana. So if the wife does, does find out a solution to the problem, how does she go about telling the husband without, for example, hurting him or affecting him in any way? Yeah, it's a difficult one because mm. every husband wants to show his wife that he's mm. the king when it comes to his 10, 15 second performance in the bedroom, you know, and I think... I think what happens is that, you know, when the wife turns around and says, um, you know, I've, I've realized that, you know, maybe what we're doing is not necessarily something to be proud of. Maybe you should go for a jog. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Or let's just go out to meals at restaurants because I think that's more exciting than your sex life. I think um, in that situation, again, the communication is vital. You know, a person can sit down with their partner and say to them that, listen, I'm not necessarily, I'm happy with so many things, but, you know, why don't we do something different tonight? Mm. You know, sometimes, subhanAllah, a person thinks an amazing, amazing sexual moment in their relationship is going to be 
all planned Valentine's Day, February the 14th, you know, candles and so on. Sometimes if a husband just impulsively books a hotel room and just says, listen, I'm coming to pick you up, we're going somewhere. That can make a buzz which is so different from the planned honeymoon. This is what we have to do, tick the boxes, couple of holidays a year, okay. You know, sometimes your partner is not necessarily looking for you to do something grand and expensive, but rather is looking for you to do something which is so impulsive, you know? Um, and so I think in that situation, maybe communicating this feeling in a soft way at the right mm -hmm. time. You, know, you don't want to communicate this feeling to me. If I'm seeing Liverpool, you know, losing to to, it's the worst time to, to West Brom and it's 3-1 it's and, and, and they're losing and then you come up to me and you're like, can we work on our sex life? <laughs> I'll be like, time. listen, forget the sex life. I'm trying to understand how we're going to sort out our goalkeeping situation here because my mind is focused on my football club. We have this keeper and that keeper, one Belgian, one German, they're going nowhere and it's nonsense. Yes, but can we discuss the sex aspect of... No, no, we're not discussing nothing until that whistle goes. Now, when I'm saying this, you, all I'm really giving a metaphor for is understanding ti understanding the minds mm. there is these books that have been written men are from uh, where men are from venus and Mar and women are from yeah, mars yeah. or something like that well I, you know I, I i apologize to the author if i i'm sure i've got it completely wrong but there are these psychological works which have looked at listen this is the right time to talk this is not the right time to talk and i think sometimes if you're <laughs> going to talk at that moment where you just lost the football game and you're like can we discuss like you know how we can <laughs> Uh, change our sex life That's and sex atmosphere. Well. That guy's just going to look at you and think, you know what? 27 years we haven't won the premiership and now you want to talk to me about my sex life and just leave. And I think there are <coughs> times, places, environments where these things can be discussed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a lot of these issues come from high expectations before marriage. There's a lot of expectations of how the relationship should be, how certain things should be done. Do you think those expectations come from, for example, pornography? And what's the dangers of pornography? Yeah, like, yeah I, think, I think porn gives this really false image about how sex should be. Mm. Um, and there is no doubt there are many people who are addicted to porn. Mm. If 60% of the internet is porn, then you know that there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who are addicted to mm. pornography. And... Uh, and this involves many Muslims who are addicted to pornography, who masturbate to pornography. Um, and then they expect their wife to be performing like how the performances are in the world of, um, in the world of pornography. And, and you couldn't be further away from reality. Mm. You know, in, in, in the world of pornography, everything is designed in a certain way with their breaks, with their this, with their that. So, you know, you think that this person the two of them are doing all of these things and it never stops. No, I'm sure they are human beings just like us and, mm. and who knows what other substances are involved mm. in, in helping certain things. But, you know, porn I think has a destructive thing. And I also think there's another thing expectations wise, the grass is green on the other side always. You mm. look at another couple and you're like, I bet they have the best relationship and I bet they have the best sex life. For, you know, as soon as they both go back home, that girl just sits on the side of the bed thinking to mm. herself, you know what, once again, he has ejaculated and I'm just sitting there. I've had no orgasm, you know, and he's never made me orgasm in my life. And, and, and she just wants to kill herself, mm. you know. So um, don't look at everybody else and think, wow, they must be amazing. In some cases, the people you think are the most bubbly are the ones who themselves have never had a mm. sensation whatsoever. Mm. Um, on that point, I'd just like to take this phone call, Sayyidina. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Please give us your name and where you are calling from. Uh, my name is Hussain Jawad from Nottingham. Uh, my question is what's the lowest form of dowry in a mut'a marriage and a next marriage? Thank you very much. The lowest form of dowry in a mut'a marriage and a fixed marriage. And the fixed marriage, 
hey, it's completely up to you. You know, normally it's something of some material value. Mm. Um, I don't know. Uh, the odd, uh, I don't know, you could give, for example, a gift like a perfume or you could give a gift like a box of chocolates. Um, something of a monetary value. Some have a debate as to whether an act, for example, such as teaching the Quran can be counted as a form of a dowry on the basis of the verse in the Quran when Nabi Musa and Shu'aib have the interaction about the daughter of Shu'aib. Inni uridu an unkihaka ahdabnatayya hatayn ala an ta'jurani thamani hijaj. That thamani hijaj, that working for him for those eight year periods is seen as a form of a, uh, a dowry. Therefore, some might say that a certain act of value, you know, where you help somebody with something can be instead of a material gift. Yeah. Um, I have a question here on WhatsApp. It links to our last point about pornography. It says, Salam, brother. My question is that whenever me and my husband have sex, my husband always has to watch porn, which annoys me. How can I stop him from doing that? I feel like he's disrespecting me. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's forbidden. It's the simple, simple line is that it's forbidden. Um, there was an odd legal opinion in Shi'i thought maybe 15 years ago where one of the scholars said if, um, if for example, a person uh, cannot have an erection and that this medically is prescribed but then I think that that type of opinion could be abused by a few guys who have no erectile problems whatsoever mm. but just want to watch porn um, however you know the act is prohibited and I think it's also something that may be disrespectful to your to your partner where you're looking at somebody else um, while your partner is with you whether it's in the form of um, you know a video or internet or so on you know I think such an act is something which is, is sad if it is taking place and I think a person should just communicate that not only they don't like it but that Islamically a follower of Ahlul Bayt should not be someone who does such a thing at all I've got another question it's more linked to what you spoke about yesterday in regards to the centers and interaction gender interaction within the centers so Salam I want to ask you uh, Sayyidina as mentioned in the previous episode, what can be done to change society as all the youth, they, they mix with the opposite gender in the public and universities. When it comes to our mosques and our Islamic centers, you have to be overprotected like you've never spoken to any of them in your life. How yeah, I know. It's amazing. Uh, you know, you see guys and girls when they're, you know, when they're out in the streets laughing, banter as soon as they come uh, to the mosque, it's as if they've never met each other. I think also the precautionary aspect of that is res is something to be appreciated. Mm. That you're in God's house, there is a recognition of a bit more chastity, a bit more modesty. I think that part is to be respected. But then on the other hand, I think sometimes we take it too too much to an extreme. Mm. I think there should be a lot more programs where the guys and girls can mix in you know in seminars on religion, programs on religion, programs for the committee. Why not? Mm. This next question I think is very important. I don't know what your take on it is said. It's, it's small, it's a simple. Um, so it says, Salam, what happens if a girl conceives a child from what a marriage? Yeah, well, it's, it's not an, the easiest situation in the world. Um, if that child comes from the what a marriage, then they both have, a, have an onus to try and uh, figure out how they're going to look after that child. Mm. Um, now, I know that Ayatollah Sistani and others have mentioned, for example, that what is the social bearability if, for example, the parents find out that a girl has had uh, a child because of mut'a or she's pregnant because of mut'a. Mm. Um, in some cases, there are clauses in Islamic law um, that may lead, if there is unbearable social harm, that may lead to an abortion taking place. Uh, but that is not the norm. A person cannot just simply say, well, you know what, I made a mistake and that's going to be our norm, so I'll go everywhere and do this. On the contrary, that would be with someone who may be in a situation of unbearable social harm. The Maraj have clearly stipulated that. However, that is something that a person also has to think about, mm -hmm. that there is a situation, there is a possibility of pregnancy and, and that could, in a way, bring about many difficulties for the future. But you certainly don't, get, don't just throw the kid in the streets and say, well, I got that kid from Mota, therefore I won't bring him up. No, you mm. have a responsibility for that maintenance. I believe we do have a call on the line. Salaamu Alaikum.
السلام عليكم عليكم السلام ورحمة الله انا ام عباس ام كولينج فروم كويدن اهلا وسهلا ويلكم برذر عباس فروم كويدن بليز بريزنت يور كويستشن تو ذا سيد يا سلام سيد اي جست وانتيد تو نو لايك كونتسبشن اند فاميلي بلانينج از اكشلي اكسبتبل ان ذا اسلام ثانك يو فيري ماتش سلام ثانك يو فيري ماتش برذر Yeah, contraception is uh, perfectly acceptable within Islamic law. You know, coitus interruptus in its origin is discussed with Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, mm. where people do mention that they're having sex, but they don't want to have a baby. So, for example, they'll withdraw. Um, and that's allowed. And contraception, the use of condoms, uh, the use of the morning after pill and so on, all of it is allowed within Islamic law. Yeah. Uh, thank you to Brother Abbas for that question. Uh, following up with more of the questions that we have on yep. the original topic It is said that a wife is always meant to be ready for her husband Now let's imagine this wife has been through challenges throughout her day She's been through trouble, she's very tired In situations like that, does she still have to be always ready for her husband? I think the husband has to appreciate that Firstly, marriage is not just all about their sex life mm. The sex life is important But sometimes a lot of the growth of that relationship is appreciation of the amount of time and effort that that wife has put with the children. Amount of time and effort that wife has helped in raising the house, not just emotionally, but in terms of monetary as well. There are mm. many um, mortgages where the two both combine to try and help build the house. Mm. Um, there are narrations that mention, of course, the right of the husband is that the wife is ready for him. But that shouldn't be enforced in a way where if you're not ready for me, I'm going to divorce you. No, a person has to uh, show to appreciate softness them, yeah. when they are with their partner. The, you know, chapter 58 of the Holy Quran discusses where a husband comes home wanting something from his wife. And because she's not ready for him at that time, he wants to then call her like the back of his mother. Mm. The famous pronouncement, which we call the pronouncement of the heart. The, the dahar, of course, is the back and so that famous pronouncement of the heart was a pronouncement that was meant to uh, say that you are to me like the back of my mom you're nothing to me now Allah mm. subhanahu wa ta'ala replied Qad Allah qawla fi wa Allah, Allah mm. so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a whole surah called surah al-mujadala chapter 58 of the holy quran is named after the lady who pleaded to god because of the way her husband treated her just because The sex wasn't necessarily, as one opinion gives it, on offer for him at the time. Um, but also, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, also mentions that there are some who may have a tendency to start making excuses. Mm. So, you know, someone might be doing a, ch a particular you know, chore in the house, and then all of a sudden that becomes longer and longer and longer until you make sure the husband's gone to bed and nothing happens. And we don't want the relationship to go towards that direction. So, mm. neither one extreme or the other. Let's assume it's the other way around. Mm. If the wife wants the husband to be ready for her, is there an obligation? Once again, with these things, there is, it's all about a person understanding each other's needs and wants through mm. communication. And we sometimes think that our wives don't have the same desires as us. But sometimes maybe our wives have got that softness and that modesty more than us. Mm -hmm. The man, animalistic straight away, you know what, I'm, <clears throat> I'm really um, hungry for sex right now. And the woman may do it in different ways, uh, a softer approach and so on. But I think if a man starts making all of these excuses, then you know what, it's, it's sad on your partner when your partner makes an effort. You know, there are certain men out there Their partner can come in dressed with the most beautiful lingerie. No, no interest. There are some who, for example, will give a lot of signs that look, you know, certain language, certain strokes. A Mr. Boring husband, for example, in many cases, just sitting there, mm. you know, with no interest whatsoever. Some husbands will say, well, there's kids there. So I, as the father figure, cannot do anything. But then you realize that it wasn't just the kids, that was an excuse. Really, that person himself wasn't giving the same effort. When does the effort come in? When the person himself is mm. feeling 
you know, full of sexual energy. Now I want my sex. And that's unfair. So there has to be a balance between the two. Now, on the, <clears throat> on the topic of sex, which is the topic of this show, there are narrations that say you should not have sex with lights on or outdoors. Why is that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> there are narrations. I'm not sure why someone would want it's it interesting outdoors. But. So you can't have sex with lights on or outdoors. Or outdoors. <laughs> I'm not sure I anyone get that one from. You know that that interestingly is mentioned. Where did I get that one from? You know that that, that is mentioned actually <laughs> in. Uh, I think if you read one of one of the most interesting and baffling books on sex, is uh, there's a book called Hilyat al Muttaqin, mm. which is meant to be about the pious, mm. um, by Alam al Majlisi. Just so how much extensive research I went through for these uh, amazing, questions. amazing. Yeah. I have to admire your <laughs> your research on sex and the outdoors and sex with lights off. Yeah, there are those traditions quite interesting. Now I think, look, sex in the outdoors. Person says, look, therefore, sex outdoors is prohibited. Mm. I think, look, anyone you driving down the M1 and you suddenly <laughs> see a couple on the side having sex, there's a major moral problem there. Whereas outdoors, look, it could be relative, it's not absolute. You know, a person can have a nice uh, villa near a beach somewhere, which mm. is secluded, and they can have sex there. But certainly, if you're thinking of going to a local park where there's a chance that, you know, someone's just walking with his wife and they see you too, it's problematic. As with the lights off, yeah, I know that there are certain people who are firm believers in this, mm. that they say, well, if you have sex with the lights on, your child will come out as a gremlin or mm. like as a as an alien or something. Um, the same thing is said on certain nights, where you shouldn't have sex on certain nights. Yes, yeah, certain nights, child, yeah. there are traditions, mm. you know, that we're told about certain nights. I, I'm a firm believer in the cosmology, mm. in the world of the cosmological, and, you know, <coughs> um, and, and to focus on recognizing the energy of the universe. Mm. There are certain nights that you shouldn't even get married on. And I think you always see these nights which are mentioned within... Uh, within, for example, uh, our, our calendars, which says mm. this is not a night to get married. But sex with, you know, having sex, you must have the lights off. Um, well, you know, I think maybe from the door of modesty that was encouraged. Um, and let's just hope everyone's accurate um, in terms of how they behave in the darkness and not end up breaking anything in the way. I have another WhatsApp message, um, follow up to the previous one about Islamic centers and our mosques. It says, Sayyidina, how about judgment? Sometimes you try and help in society, such as Islamic TV shows and Islamic centers and so on. However, people get judged for the smallest things they do, just by simply speaking to someone outside the mosque or instead of just simply speaking and they get judged on it. How do you deal with these situations? Well, Because it might affect sure. reputation, yeah. I think if you're in the public eye, you've got to be ready for being judged. Mm. I think secondly, if you're doing things for God, God will reward you. Mm. Uh, Imam Ali ibn Abi Salam lived the most immaculate life and he's still got people calling him a disbeliever and so mm. on. So don't worry about necessarily the words of the people. Even people attack God and he lets them get away with it. Mm. Um, and I know that some of our people are, you know, I, wouldn't, I don't want to say backward mind. I want to say they're adapting to the realities of today. And that is, you know, more social interaction, but with, you know, with the possibility of modesty, which many of them never thought could happen. Mm. Yep. I have another message. It's a bit off topic, but uh, let's answer it nonetheless. The sister is asking, I wish to be part of the police force and I can be wearing gloves while I'm on the force. Is it permissible for me to do so? Is there reasons why I can't be allowed to join the police force? Well, you know what? This can be approached from so many angles. There have been, you know, discussions on this area that is this police force one, which is destroying, for example, the followers of Ahl al-Bayt's lives. Mm. Um, if it is, then of course, people will say that you shouldn't work for them. But then you've got a situation where some imams encourage their followers mm. to work for governments that are oppressive to look after the interests mm. of, of the Shia of the time. And I think either from that door where you can look after the interests of the Shia of the time or where your role will help build uh, the future of your community, then those are doors which mm -hmm. mean that you can work in the police force. Yeah. Uh, we are coming towards the end of our show, but we do have one more phone call. Sure, go ahead. So can we take this call, please? Assalamu alaikum. 
Uh, can I have your name and where you are calling from, please? I'm calling from uh, Kerbalo. You're welcome from the greatest city in the world. What is your name, brother? My name is Jafar. Jafar, welcome. Please present your question to the Sayyid. Uh, Sayyid, now I have a question. Is it possible to have uh, intercourse in a holy city or in a holy month? Yes, the, uh, thank you so much. There's no issue in having, um, you know, sexual intercourse in a holy city or in a holy month. Mm -hmm. I know that some people say, for example, that holy month is a sad month, so there should be no sex. No, life continues. These are all acts of ibadah at the end of the day. These are acts where you have rights, your wife has rights, you have duties, you have obligations. Naturally, if it is the saddest day of the year, then a person should be happy in the days of the happiness of Al Muhammad mm. and sad in the days of sadness of Al Muhammad. Um, and a person, you know, may themselves have their own choice of saying that in this area I don't want to, for example, engage in such an act because such mm. an act doesn't, you know, just because it's uh, halal for you doesn't mean it's obligatory, obligatory on you to do. Mm. However, to turn around to your wife, for example, in you know, a certain month and say, I can't have sex in this month because it's this month. No, it's, it's a form of ibadah and it's an obligation. Um, also, in some cases, to prevent haram from possibly happening. I sent him saying that I'd like to thank you, thank you for this show. It's been an honor. Pleasure. Um, and it's been a good uh, time to host you, especially in London, thank you. back in uh, the hometown. I'd like to thank you, dear viewers, for tuning in. Inshallah, you can join us on Friday. We will continue the discussion with Sayyid Dr. Sayyid Amal Naqshwani. Uh, but for now, I'd like to leave you to enjoy your week, and we'll see you on Friday, inshallah.